This thing seems high. It looks like I'm looking over you guys. Hey, Brian, can you hear me at that end? I can. Is that you, General Caldwell? Yeah, it sure is. We're just working on getting your picture into the, uh, into the studio, but we hear you good, and now we see you. Very good. Well, thank you, uh, okay. General Caldwell, for taking some time this morning, and uh, good morning to the press corps here. Uh, we know that you've been very busy, but there's still an awful lot of interest in uh, the activities and the operations that have been taking place in in Iraq. And uh, so we appreciate you taking some time to, to talk to us back here in the Pentagon today. Uh, you know, this is, uh, I don't think you need any introduction, but this is Major General William Caldwell, and he's speaking to us today from Baghdad. And with that, General, why don't I turn it right over to you? Okay, well, thanks, Brian. Um, listen, I... To, to everybody there, I'm uh, glad to be here today to help clarify and uh, further elaborate on anything that's gone on in the last 48 hours here in Iraq. Uh, as we stated the other day, and it's very, very important for everybody to understand, the elimination of Zarqawi is not going to stop the violence here in Iraq. I mean, clearly, as General Casey stated, and he's correct, it is an important step forward, and it's a, it's, it's a big one. But at the same time, we still have some tough times ahead of us. Uh, the Iraqi people are going to assume a great responsibility here. Uh, the Prime Minister himself has stated, those who elected and put them into power are the same ones now that have to rid Iraq of the violence, of a violence like Zarqawi. And so the people have a big part to play, but there's a government in place, duly elected. We've appointed the Minister of Defense, Interior, and National Security. Uh, the Prime Minister now has a full cabinet. Uh, he's got a plan for Baghdad, he's announced, a uh, Baghdad security plan. And uh, we're actually very optimistic as we move forward here, having set a lot of conditions that give them that opportunity uh, to take greater control of their country uh, with us working in support of them. So really with that, I'll just take whatever questions you all have. Well, thank you. We'll get right into it. Uh, Bob, why don't you go ahead? Uh, General Caldwell, this is Bob Burns from AP. Uh, could you first uh, give us a hey, different? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Could you give us the definitive word on how I'm many? Sorry, just the delay, I believe. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now, Bob. Could you give us the definitive word on how many people were killed in the airstrike, and also give us the rationale for choosing to take Zarqawi out, uh, kill him outright, rather than try to capture him and uh, exploit the intelligence value, capture him alive? Okay, um, I just came from, I just flew back in here about a, two hours ago from a location where I was, I was getting some of the debriefing material to look at so I could better answer some of your all's questions. Um, what I would tell you is I, I have not sat and talked to them and asked them exactly why the decision was made uh, to attempt to take them uh, utilizing uh, an airstrike. Uh, I'd have to go back and ask that question, but clearly, uh, that was a decision that was made by the commander on the ground. I would assume that if we were going to have gone in there and tried to have captured him, that would have taken us some kind of overwhelming force at that point in time, and that perhaps they didn't have it ready. But we'll have to check on that. I'm not sure what the uh, process were that went into that decision. And the uh, first question, General, how many people were killed in the attack? And who was the, who was the commander on the ground that you referred to? The, uh, the, no, the, the, uh, Attack casualties I was asking again about today to help clarify that. Uh, I was told that they're still giving me the final confirmation. A as with any operation that ever occurs, first reports are, are never 100 percent correct, and we do continue to follow up to make sure we have established exactly what the facts were on the ground. Uh, I do know from what they told me this afternoon that there were six people that were killed in that airstrike, three males, three females, different than what I was read in the report yesterday. And so I had asked them to go back and double check it one more time uh, so that we can be definitively sure exactly what it was. 
uh, but the report that they were reading today and the back brief with me was three males and three females. Barbara, go ahead. General Caldwell, Barbara Starr from CNN. Also, can you give us the definitive word now? Do you have any information that Sarkawi initially survived the airstrike, that he was alive at any point in the hands of either Iraqi or U.S. forces? And can you tell us if one of the women uh, was uh, identified as one of Sarkawi's wives or someone related to him? Barbara, what I can tell you is that, again, from the debriefs this morning, which gave us greater clarity than what we had before, is Zarqawi, in fact, did survive uh, the airstrike. The report specifically states that nobody else did survive, though, from what they know. The first people on the scene were the Iraqi police. They had found him and put him into uh, some kind of gurney stretcher kind of thing, and then American coalition forces uh, arrived immediately thereafter on site. They immediately went to, uh, to the person in the stretcher, were able to start identifying by some distinguishing marks on his body. Um, they had some kind of visual facial recognition. Uh, according to the uh, person on the ground, uh, Zarqawi attempted to sort of turn away off the uh, stretcher. Uh, they, everybody resecured him back onto the stretcher, but he died almost immediately thereafter from the wounds he had received from this airstrike. As far as anybody else, again, the report says nobody else survived. To clarify then, you can confirm that U.S. troops themselves saw and can confirm to you that Sarkawi was alive. That is confirmed by U.S. troops on the ground. And his attempt to turn away, would you describe that as an attempt, uh, even in the state he was in, to escape at that point? Why did you have, was he strong enough for anyone to have to re-secure him? Um, again, I'm, I'm reading the report. I did not talk specifically to any uh, uniformed person, but according to the report, we did in fact see him alive. Uh, there was some kind of movement he had on the stretcher and he died shortly thereafter. But yes, he, it was confirmed by other uh, than the Iraqi police that he was alive initially. Sorry, did anyone render medical assistance to him? Did U.S. troops try and render medical assistance? It, it, again, Barbara, as I was reading the report, they, they went into the process to provide medical care uh, to him. I uh, will. Uh, General, how can we keep losing? General, this is Will Dunham with Reuters. <coughs> how long, how many minutes was uh, Zarqawi alive uh, after the bombing and before he eventually expired? And had he been shot? Well, I, when I was there today, that's, it became apparent that this kind of question would be asked. We're trying to put that exact minutes together uh, from the time that we saw the Iraqi police arrive on site to when the first uh, coalition forces arrived on site and when they uh, were able to report that they thought uh, he had he had died there and we'll, and we'll provide that we can put that together I we just don't have it at the moment sir had he been shot there was nothing that I saw in the report but I'll go back and specifically ask that but no there was nothing in the report that said he had received any uh, wounds from some kind of weapon system like that uh, Brian, Jim McLeshevsky with NBC, uh, or General, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, will there be an autopsy performed, number one? Uh, and number two, uh, was Zarqawi able to speak? Did he say anything uh, either to the Iraqi police or the American soldiers? If he said something to the Iraqi police, I'm not aware of it. Uh, according to the reports by the coalition forces that arrived on site, he, he mumbled a little something, but it was indistinguishable, and that and it was very short. Um, an autopsy? Will an autopsy be performed? Uh, they, in fact, have done some uh, analysis of his body. I'll have to get the, make sure I have the proper definition of what was done. 
uh, with Zarkawi's body, but I know they have done some kind of analysis, and I'll get you that for you. Jeff, go ahead. Uh, General, Jeff Shogel with Stars and Stripes. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, how can you be sure that he died, uh, that Zarqawi died as a result of the wounds he received from the explosion without a formal autopsy? And secondly, um, when you were cleaning him up, did you have to Photoshop his face or anything to make him more recognizable uh, for the picture? To take your second question first, yes, Jeff, his face was very, very bloodied. And uh, we made a conscious decision that if we were going to take photographs of him and make them available publicly, uh, like we did in the press conference, that we were going to clean him up. Despite the fact that this person actually had no regard for human life, we were not going to treat him in the same manner. And so they did clean his face up uh, for the shots that were shown publicly. As far as the autopsy goes, there was, I know that, quote, was an autopsy done, but I'm going to go back to make sure that it was performed by whatever the certified kind of person that we're supposed to have so we can call it a autopsy uh, and make sure I'm exactly correct before I tell you that. Follow up, did you have to digitally enhance the photos at all to clean them up, to, to show them to the world? Now, the, the photographs there are, are the straight photographs. We did no digital en enhancement from this end. Hello. General, this is Pam Hess with UPI. What's going to happen to Zarqawi's body after the autopsy? Does he get returned to Jordan to his family? And do you have anything on the identity of the other um, the others killed in the in the um, strike? Was it six victims total, including um, Zarqawi, or was it seven? Um, right now, we are in, in consultation with the government of Iraq as far as the disposition of uh, Zarqawi's body. I know the dialogue has been going on since uh, after the shortly after the strike, and he was brought under coalition forces control. Uh, so that's still being deliberated. Uh, they may have made a decision late here this afternoon. They had not as of noon today. Um, as far as the identification of the other personnel goes, uh, I know they're still working it. The only two that have been positively identified at this point, uh, of course, is Zarqawi and uh, Al Rockman. And again, those was we were able to do through fingerprint identification. DNA results have still not come back as of noon today, and we're waiting for those results, though, too. The other four, they are trying to attempt to identify, uh, but as of noon today, again, we had not. Report yesterday that a, a child was killed in that. Are you saying that, that that's not the case right now? I'm saying I'm not certain at the moment because the initial report that I was provided in fact, said there was a child. And then when I went through the after action review today, again, as with any military operation, you get the first reports in. They're fairly accurate, but they're never complete. Uh, and then you give full on work to establish exactly what the factual facts are. And uh, the report today says it was six people, three males and three females, uh, no children. John. Uh, General Jonathan Carl with ABC News. You, you mentioned. Oh. Uh, General Jonathan Carl with ABC News. You mentioned yesterday that there were uh, 17 raids conducted simultaneously in and around Baghdad after Zarqawi was confirmed dead. Can you give us any more information on this treasure trove of, info of, of documents and information you got, and how many people were detained as a result of those raids? Um. We, we obviously did conduct uh, those 17 raids, and then last night we conducted an additional 39 operations across Iraq, some directly related to the information we had received, others uh, in, have not a uh, direct uh, relationship. Um, I can show you some pictures from one of the raids. We, we did get some digital photos back from one site where they went in and they found a cache of things. In fact, if you wouldn't mind, uh, technical guys back there. Can you throw that up? All right. This is uh, some pictures that just came back in this morning from that raid the other night. You can see this is an, uh, a floor element here We're underneath the floor in the house. They were uh, putting a lot of military gear and uh, suicide gear. We'll pull it out here in a couple of following photographs, lay it out, and show it to you. Next slide, please. You can see they had everything from uh, passports, identification cards. On the top right there, you'll see a night observation device. Next slide. On the left side over here, you'll see they had some Iraqi Army uniforms. 
and this uh, cache. Next slide. And again, some more of the armament. Next slide. That's it laid out uh, so you can see the amount of stuff. You'll see they have some license plates for cars there too, uh, about the top middle. And a lot of vests, those vests primarily over there are just ammunition vests. Next slide. Again, more of the armament. Next slide. Close up of the uh, ammunition vest and then the uniforms on the right side, the Iraqi Army uniforms. Next slide. Next slide. Close up uh, ammunition uh, belt. Next slide. Not sure, it's either a flak vest or some side or type of uh, uh, bulletproof vest there uh, that they could wear. On the far right, that white thing, and I'll show you another picture of it here in a second, uh, is a suicide belt. Next slide. That's a more close up view of the suicide belt. belt. Have another picture of it. Next slide. And that's a close up of it. You can see the uh, activation device there in the center. I think that's it. Next slide. Okay, another picture of it. Next slide. And again, that's the hole there in that house uh, where they went in and conducted the raid and found all that underneath the uh, floorboard. I think that's it, right? Where, uh, sir, where is that raid, please? I'll have to get that location for you. It's in and around the Baghdad area. I looked at the uh, 17 sites today. All of them were either inside Baghdad or within about a 15-mile right, radius right around Baghdad, but uh, centered around all 17 around the Baghdad area. How many people you detained as a result of, of these uh, raids? I will get you that exact number. I was going through the figures today. I saw two different numbers. Uh, one showed a detention of 25 personnel with one killed. Another one had a different number. But uh, I'll give you that number. That's uh, the lower of the two until I can confirm it. 25 detained, one KIA. That's not a friendly. That's uh, uh, an enemy. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, General, it's Nick Simeone at Fox. Um, I was unclear whether you said it was six, including Zarqawi, that was killed, or whether Zarqawi makes seven. And secondly, was there any um, plastic surgery used to um, reconstruct his face to make it more presentable before yesterday's news conference? Um, that number is six, which includes Zarqawi. So it's not seven, but just six total. Uh, there was none that I know of. I'll verify that by going back and asking the question but I did not see it stated anywhere that, in fact, that had occurred, so I don't think it did. But I'll verify that for you. In general, everybody's asking the question, how possibly could he have survived uh, uh, seemingly intact uh, after two 500-pound bombs were dropped on that, on that facility? Was he outside? Uh, was he thrown clear? Uh, is there any uh, visibility on, on why he was able to survive that, those two bombs? Well, that, that's the exact same question I, I asked today when I sat down with several Air Force officers, to include some that were associated with uh, the, the whole operation. And they assured me that there, there are cases when people, in fact, can survive uh, even an attack like that on a building structure. Obviously, the other five in the building did not, uh, but he did for some reason. And, and I, we do not know, and I have looked through the reports as to whether or not it was because he might have been right outside or whatever, we just don't have that uh, granularity. Tony. Hi, sir. Tony Capasio with Bloomberg News. Two questions. One, the $25 million tip reward, uh, what's the latest thinking on will anybody receive that? Okay, just, uh, just one question. But I'm not going to give you a machine gun. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. I think that everybody needs to understand is that when, we, when the coalition forces put together the information that led to this strike the other day, it was a painstaking effort, very focused over about three weeks. And during that time period, there was a lot of information that came in allowing us to build that puzzle that led us to that evening when we were able to ascertain that Sarkawi. Uh, was in that, and, and Rockman were in that building together. It, it, the information we had was never somebody coming forth and saying, at this time, 
at this place, you will find Zarqawi in this building. That did not occur. In fact, it was the result of some tremendous work by coalition forces, intelligence agencies, partners uh, in our global war on terrorism that all came together feeding different parts and pieces to allow us to build that puzzle to establish the patterns, the methods, the techniques which allowed us to track and then monitor things which led us to that building that night to find Zarqawi in there. Bob is far, go ahead. Get involved with that. In the planning that went into this, was there any going in assumption that you would try to take Zarqawi alive rather than kill him? Or was it always the assumption we'll have to kill him rather than you try to use any force to capture him? I did not specifically talk to the operational commander on the ground about that question. Um, but I do know that if, in fact, U.S. military or coalition forces feel that in the execution of a target that it's going to lead to exorbitant American or coalition forces losses uh, that uh, will use proportional force and rather than put young men and women's life at risk. Uh, so I, I'll have to go back and uh, ask the, the logic that went in behind that. But I think what they did was very appropriate and proportional to the fact that Zarqawi is the number one terrorist in Iraq. He has proven to be a brutal murderer that has absolutely no consideration for civilian life. Uh, so there are actions that night, and you have to ask yourself, is it worth putting American men and women's lives at risk to go into what probably was a heavily fortified and guarded thing uh, in order to grab him? Global commander's call. It wasn't General Casey's call or General Cirelli's call. It was the local commander's call. Well, as we talked, Jesse, you know, General Casey has done a tremendous job empowering his commanders in the field here to make those kind of tactical decisions that are necessary to prosecute this war against terrorists and to work in support of the government of Iraq. Uh, at the lowest level possible, that decision was made uh, by a, a, an operations officer down there uh, based on what he was operating with, with many factors being utilized. And just before executing, uh, went ahead and ensured that his commanders above him had situational awareness of what was about to go down as they had just a couple of minutes there as they called that F-16 in because they had two of them up there flying. Uh, one was hitting a tanker. So as they called in and asked for the operation to be executed, uh, the other one couldn't come off the tanker. So that single bird came in on a single ship and uh, executed that, which gave them a few minutes to do the notification up that they were about to take down Zarqawi. We've got time for one or two more. Let's go to Pam real quick. Uh, it's Pam Hess again. Would you tell us a little bit more about these 17 raids? You hinted yesterday in your opening statement that you've been watching people in order to lead you to Zarqawi. So uh, those 17 yeah. raids go back and focus on the people that you've been watching to lead you to Zarqawi. And would you tell us more about al-Masri, who you identified yesterday as being the guy you expect to take over? Yeah, the, the 17 raid, there was obviously more operations that occurred in and around Iraq yesterday than just, or the day before, than the 17. Those are 17 focused ones that were directly related to the intense intelligence effort that had been going on in tracking Zarqawi. There are certain personnel that we have been watching, that we've been monitoring, that the uh, coalition forces had made the decision not to take down at that time because they were giving us key indicators at different points in time as to where Zarqawi might be. So they were just monitored, watched, and tracked. But once our cavalry went down, then that enabled us to go in and conduct those operations, the 17 focused operations directly related uh, to targeting Zarqawi. I mean, if that helps him in painting that picture there. Al Masri, what more can you tell us about him? And is he one of the 25 you detained? Now, uh, unfortunately, he's not one of the ones we picked up. Uh, what we do know about him, he's Egyptian born. We know that he and Zarqawi met each other uh, at the Al Farouk training camp in Afghanistan probably sometime in the early 2001 to 2002 time period. Uh, we know that uh, uh, Al Masri was, came to Iraq before Zarqawi did, probably located somewhere around the Baghdad area sometime in around 2003, established probably the first Al Qaeda in Iraq uh, cell here in, in the Baghdad area and that they've continued a very close uh, relationship since that time. All right, we're going to finish up here. Barbara, you want to take the last one? 
Caldwell Barber star from CNN. Uh, Al Masri, does he, to your knowledge, have any relationship at this point uh, or communication with Osama bin Laden or Sawahiri? We, we know he had communication with Zawahiri. Uh, anything else beyond that would, would be uh, an operational channels and probably not something we should talk about. But uh, it, it's very clear that, you know, he, he had very close contacts with Sarkawi. Contact with Zawahiri. How long ago? I'm sorry. How long ago was the contact you said that you know that he had with uh, Zawahiri? Um, the specifics of that I'd have to go back and get for you. I'm not sure that's declassified yet. Name of Al Masri, please. What was the question on Al Masri? His first name, please. His first name, please. Abu. Uh, I, I'll spell it A Y Y U B. So Abu A B U. The next word is A Y Y U B. Al, and then Masri is M A S R I. If, uh, with respect, to, if you say that he had communications with uh, Zawari, uh, does that not also really by definition mean he was in communication with bin Laden? <laughs> Barbara, again, for operational reasons, I really uh, can't discuss any contact he had with anybody else at this point. All right, <laughs> really come to the end of our time and a little bit beyond I know so we just again want to thank you and uh, let me turn it back to you in case you have anything you want to say uh, as we close this up now I, I, I guess the only thing I would say is you know for the first time uh, in three years the Iraqi people really do have a real chance here they have a duly elected government they now have the ministers of interior defense and national security, which they have not had previously, which gives that prime minister a cabinet now he can work with. The governor of Iraq has taken the lead. Uh, the statements you hear coming from the prime minister are very encouraging as he talks about unity, security, and prosperity within the country of Iraq. I mean, we're all extremely optimistic and hopeful uh, as this government moves forward and the people will support it. and. Uh, that they have an opportunity for a future that they have not had before. And uh, we're going to work in very close support with that government, uh, giving them all the help we can. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, General. Thank you.